Franz, it's been a long journey over the last three years. Just three years. Three years. We just got started. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it is such a pleasure to be here with such a wonderful group of global <laughs> HR leaders to share our story. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here too because I fundamentally believe that culture makes the difference for us as a company. You know, we are a large 25 billion euro company. We have 115,000 people. How do you get a better result out of that? Exactly, exactly. And we know it's, especially in HR, it's kind of rare to hear a CEO speak so passionately yeah. about culture. So we know it's close to your heart. And our intention today is to ignite some curiosity, to share some lessons learned about where we are in our journey, and maybe instill some confidence in having you go to your organizations to try something a bit different, a bit new, because of course what one can do, so can another. So tell us, since it's such a topic close to your heart, Franz, what does culture mean to you personally? Well, I fundamentally believe that culture makes or breaks a company. And let me give you a little bit of personal insight. Um, even though I only became CEO of Philips in 2011, actually I was born in Philips because my father was working in Philips and he always came home with stories about innovation, uh, but also about frustration. You know, why do we invent something and then people don't sell it? Why don't we get a better result out of it? So I've kind of throughout my youth been inundated with great inspiring innovation, but also the lack of sometimes success. And Philips over the years has been a restructuring case for quite a long time. Mm. And so when I uh, rejoined uh, Philips uh, in 2011 to become the CEO, I felt I had to go really, really deep to understand mm. what is it in our DNA that works and what is it that we need to change. Yeah, yeah. I resonate a lot with that, and particularly what we talked about in the beginning of our transformation when we talked about unlocking potential. That was a key word that you, key phrase that you used repeatedly. That's also a word that motivates you, right, Teddy? Yeah, actually it does, Franz, it does. Um, I have a really personal connection to that, and it has to do with my brother Michael. When I was 12 years old, my brother was having some difficulties and what they said was, you know, he doesn't live up to his potential. I was seven at the time, so I wasn't totally sure what they meant, but I was pretty sure that he was a whole lot smarter than he acted. And um, my brother was 29. He never reached the age of 30, and he died. And he never reached his full potential. But, you know, Franz, he gave me a gift and it was to recognize my purpose is really about helping people reach potential and helping organizations, and especially teams. I do love teams. Well, that's great, and this is why we connect so well, because I know that to get to the full potential of Philips, we need to unlock all those talents that are working for our company, and we have to do something quite different. And we'll get to that, but let's first talk for a moment about all the wonderful things that Philips is doing. Now, we are an innovation company. Um, and I guess you get to see that here. You know, we invent to improve people's lives. Um, we can save people's lives through our innovations in healthcare. Uh, we can make the planet better by energy efficient lighting. Um, we invent things. And actually, it goes back straight to the uh, invention of the company 123 years ago when Gerard Phillips um, started to invent the light bulb. And then his brother Anton joined and the company started to flourish. And what did Anton bring? He was just a kid of 20 years, but he got on the train, went to Russia, sold lights to the Winter Palace of the Tsar uh, and made it grow. So this combination of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, I think that is what really makes a company tick. And that's the core DNA that I want to foster. Um, I think that is what brings value to customers, that makes them smile, that makes them happy. <laughs> Core DNA. And uh, we've actually spent the last three years in looking at how do we really build on that Core DNA. So what are some of your thoughts? Because I, I, I dare say you've probably spent more time than most business leaders thinking about culture and how culture plays such a role in nurturing <coughs> that DNA. 
But let's take a look at that and let's hear from you, Franz, about what is the role of culture in transforming our company? Well, you've already talked about potential and all the talents that we have in the company. Um, and it is important that we emphasize those talents that are really important, such as innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and that we also understand what, what blocks us mm. uh, in, in that collaboration. Um, and I think this is where we talk about culture, uh, how people connect with each other, how they drive a result together, how they engage with customers, how they lean forward, how they lean in. And I want to, to get to the full potential that you also spoke about. Yeah, yeah. Which is why, by the way, we're on these crates. When I first suggested to Franz that we have a conversation, I said, you know, how about a nice comfy armchair and a couch? And he goes... Oh, but then we lean back. Yeah. He goes, no, we want crates to lean in. So I, I'm very grateful for the pillow yeah. here for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you talk about the strengths and our DNA. We also recognize in all of the companies that we operate in that there are things that need to shift things that really need to fundamentally change to meet the realities of the marketplace. So when you came in three years ago, what did you see that needed to change and well, why? Well, why? Let, let me first share with you that I had a really motivational moment when my own board said, well, of course, France, I mean, this company has not been growing for a long time. Now, why actually would you make a difference? Mm -hmm. You're only one guy. Okay, thank you for that encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I knew that we had to go deep uh, and understand, you know, what are the things we should be proud of and what are the things that we should tackle. And, and we did see bureaucracy. We, see, we did see people operate in silos. I'm sure I see people nodding. I mean, you all recognize this. Yeah. And when a company that is older has gone through several years of reorganization, you also get people into survival behavior. And they duck rather than that they lean forward and take a risk. Um, and I think this kind of uh, explains the shortcomings of the culture, yeah. where people sit in their, in their office in maybe uh, one city, but they don't really reinvent themselves because that's actually risky. So you need to call that out. Um, and then um, to drive a result with 115,000 people, how do we get people to connect, to um, become entrepreneurial together? Mm. As hospital customers get a result because people in marketing, R&D, procurement, manufacturing, sales, service, all across the world will yeah. drive a result together. Yep. That doesn't go by itself. Yeah. So we really had to get people together and engage on that. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the foundational pieces that you put in place three years ago was our behaviors. I know these are very dear to you. So what are they? And how do they actually relate to some of those improvement areas that you just outlined? Absolutely. Well, we had to touch people, we had to touch people really in their gut uh, mm. so that we, they would get out of the mode that they had always been in. And we formulated in 2011 a set of four behaviors that we said those are going to really connect with people and move the needle. Eager to win. Why would we not be eager to win and beat Samsung or other competitors at their own game? We can do that when we lean in and we are ambitious. Secondly, taking ownership. Instead of being, what was already mentioned this morning, being a passenger and uh, on the sideline, that we call it a tourist, we need people that say, here is an opportunity I engage. Here is a problem. Let me help solve it. Moreover, third behavior, um, teaming up to excel. We are a high-tech company. Nobody can drive a result on their own. We need to do it together. And the better we do it together, the faster products go to the market, the better the result is, the better the customer experience, and of course, the better the profit is going to be. And finally, and this is also really important, acting with integrity. Mm -hmm. When you cut corners in a high-tech business, it's somewhere down the road it will hit you because the quality is not there or you have not been in compliance with the federal uh, drug administration mm -hmm. rules uh, or... Uh, you know, maybe uh, anti-cartel behavior hits you. Yeah. So these four, I think, are quite fundamental and can be easily remembered by people and they, and they hit you really deep. So this was what we all adopted and start emphasize, emphasizing and living and practicing on. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure if we were to look out into our group of colleagues here, how many of you have behaviors in your organization? Yeah, of course. 
So here comes the million dollar question, Franz. Or maybe a million euros would be better, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did we go about changing our behaviors? Yeah, so it, it is not about working harder because, in fact, the, the work ethos was quite good. People were working hard and their commitment was, was okay. So it was about working differently. <laughs> and so we understood that we had to go deep uh, in uh, getting people to be able to understand what was blocking them, um, giving them new insights in how they collaborate. Um, and we brought cross-functional teams together in one room. And we used the, the U theory uh, actually to underpin and to build this, this, these workshops. And the first question I always ask, are you happy with the current results in the business? And usually people would say, no, no, not really. And then we say, why, why is that? Well, it's because he or it's because she doesn't do their job. Of course, I'm okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then we say, well, but, you know, can we go deeper and reflect on what your contribution is? And can we <laughs> reflect on what the insights are, what is necessary to, to become successful? And we, we discovered balcony moments. We discovered blind spots. We discovered that people were actually in the way of having a courageous conversation and shifting their frame on what it takes to drive a great result and win more <laughs> customers and beat Samsung and be and so on. So going down the U was fundamental for us to help people go from one place to the next. And the beautiful thing is as you take a team through this and people have in, uh, discovered where they need, have blind spots they need to shift, the team bonds together and comes with a, a breakthrough uh, action plan, both for yourself and for the team. And then you're in a mode where you can go from A to B in, into a better space. And the productivity of the team goes up in a wonderful way. Yeah, very, very powerful. And we use that theory U. It was developed by Otto Scharmer and Peter Senge out of uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and we did that for the Accelerate Leadership Program, our ALP, and also, there was such a demand from the middle of the organization, such a pull, that we developed a two-day version called Accelerate Team Performance. But you made a very bold move right from the start, Franz, as a CEO. And that is that you actually called for all of our senior leaders to go through this very profound change and innovation process. So why well, did you, you do that? You, you bet. Um, and I'm scared to death that change doesn't only happen at the surface, but then three years later, uh, you haven't moved the needle. Yeah. So we realized that we had to go deep. And um, you're here in the Netherlands, and we have a lot of clay, but there's clay layers in the company, <laughs> and you need to break through that. So we said we have to go deep, multi-layer, middle management, even below, uh, and get people to all engage in this new way. Um, and we did, 7,000 people is a lot of people, um, and we are still going strong. There's yeah. a big demand for this now. Huge. And we start seeing people really using it very actively, where um, I even had my secretary walk up to me and say, I want to have a courageous conversation with you, Franz. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes things discussable. So you equip people with new tools uh, to problem solve in situations. Um, we have created a common language that uh, helps people say we need to do this, um, to, uh, to recognize the elephant in the room, to recognize the balcony moments, to, to talk about the icebergs yeah. uh, and, and where people are. So this is profound and has worked very well for us. I can correlate business performance to teams that have done this and teams that have not done this. Uh, it makes a real difference. Yeah. And how about for you personally? What impact has this had on you in your leadership journey? A lot, a lot. Let me just explain what's on the screen here because I think I didn't mention that. Um, has been pervasive and then people start putting it on the wall in their offices as a recognizable reminder. Uh, actually, it's visual management because then it is a constant reminder of what we are about. And this is a poster that we discovered in the United Kingdom yeah. in our organization. Yep. And then you, you know, you, it really feels good because people uh, have made it their own. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, and, and yes, Terry, you're right. I've also learned things. I mean, 
you continue to learn about yourself. Um, uh, let's say my, my own leadership style, uh, as I grew up through the ranks as a smart kid, was often telling people, you know, do this, do that. You know, I've already figured it out. Why don't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't really make me a, a scalable leader. Uh, so I just discovered that becoming more of an enabling leader, uh, being open for understanding the impact of what I say to other people, that it actually helps me become a more effective leader. But that means I need to start I into an inquiry mode mm. rather than into a command mode. So, um, yeah, this, these, these things are powerful. Um, and I also I dare say sometimes you need to remind yourself of it because we all have our natural styles. Um, and this is a way to keep people uh, sharp. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Franz. Now, we've also, you said you can correlate this to some business performance. So let's talk about where this shows up in the business. Because after all, we are in business. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we have many what we call business market combinations where global business units and local market teams need to collaborate in order to drive a success. And we had acquired this new activity in China, which is around cooking and rice cooking. And uh, of course, great success in China. Um, but only so-so success in, in Russia. And people had their frame of mind that in Russia people don't eat rice. So it's okay to have a mediocre result. But then some people said, no, that's maybe not okay. Let's go deeper. And the cross-functional team went in. Uh, the guy from China came over to Russia. Deep insight development into what the customer needs were. And they actually changed the product. <laughs> they said, let's not call this a rice cooker. Let's call this a multi-cooker. And let's gear it towards Russian dishes. And because this was a co-creation where our people no longer were stuck in their traditional roles like I invent, you sell. No, we co-create what works for the Russian market. You know what? In one year, we sold one million multi-cookers in Russia. That is one out of 100 families in Russia. This was phenomenal. We created the market. It was a huge success. Um, this is where in inventiveness, entrepreneurship, you know, the core of the Phillips brothers who started the company okay. all comes together. That's the behavior you want to, f to foster. That's right. Making Russian moms really happy so they can make their soups and stews and their porridge in the morning. <laughs> exactly. That's great. But we're not saying it's all been a smooth ride because we are in process. And we know that without constant reminder, we could easily slip back to old ways of being. So let's take a look at some of the major shifts that our teams have identified, our from behavior and our to behavior, which we're still in the midst of. Which of these talk to you, Franz? Well, they, they all resonate very much. And, and in fact, there are, our list is even longer. But yeah. from internally focused to customer and market driven, where we are all focused on that. I, my example was just that. From being a victim and complaining at the coffee machine to engaging into a courageous conversation to say, how are we actually progressing and, and solving our frustrations? Um, I think the rest speaks for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is, of course, also something that when we found that the markets and our businesses grabbed hold of it, there was such a pull in the organization, right? So it went really from push to pull. But we also recognized there was a risk with that yeah. because people can start developing, in a sense, their own separate cultures. And then we go right back into silos. We saw that with change management, for example, people having their own methodology, not having the same language. So we recognized that we needed to hardwire the culture directly into our business and into our team ways of working. So can you talk a little bit about how do we do that? Yeah. I'm a real fan of the Galbraith model, where all the five elements of the star come together in a holistic way. Uh, many companies all, always restructure, and that's only one of the five bubbles. It all needs to reinforce each other, and the same with culture. So embedding the culture um, in uh, capabilities and learning, in targets and reward, uh, linking it to the processes and how people collaborate, uh, ensuring that people 
work together across structures. Yeah. So we have done this and we've integrated it because we believe we should really anchor it deeply. Yeah, yeah. So instead of working on the processes and systems expecting that's going to change behavior, we started from the inside out and then, of course, made sure that all of our structures and processes reflect our culture. Exactly. So we've learned a few things, and as we say, we're still in process, but it might be helpful to our audience here to just reflect a little bit on some of our lessons learned. Yeah, many, lear many lessons learned, and I guess we are still learning. Um, first point is that transformation doesn't happen by accident. Uh, this is a massive effort um, where we really need to ask people to go deep and change. That's not easy. Uh, it also means that we need to give them a North Star. Mm. What is it all for? Um, is there a compelling reason to make the investment? Um, and we, we've done that by, by formulating a better vision and mission for the company. People get a lot of energy to say, this is why we need to change. Another um, uh, one, and I think we touched upon it, to create a coherent performance culture, uh, you have to have a common language. Everybody has to adopt the same methodology so that when people from different subsets of the organization meet each other, they connect on the same tool set uh, and it starts to uh, re reinforce each other. Uh, I, I guess another one is, you know, all levels um, because 115,000 people don't change overnight and yeah. you really need to have a lot of uh, depth there. And, and we have also seen people that shouldn't stay with us. Yeah. Uh, we have changed quite a lot of people in uh, the management and also at other layers of the organization. Uh, my most important lesson learned is keep at it. Um, even recently I spoke to an executive uh, on culture change and uh, he said, it takes one year per layer of the organization. Mm. I said, boy, eight layers, that means eight years. I don't have eight years. <laughs> but surely two years is too short <laughs> to change a culture. So maybe three, four, five years, but stay at it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Franz. You're welcome. And I hope that uh, this is something that now will challenge you and to say, what are you going to do in changing the culture? And I'll leave it right there in the room with you. Um, I guess one of the things that was interesting to me was, Franz, you were talking about the, the sort of clay in the Netherlands, this sort of, you know, this bedrock, <laughs> and, you know, the, the layers. And um, I guess it's always interesting, you know, in change, you know, some people will, will, will embrace the change and, uh, and go with the flow. Others might pretend to and, and others just don't. So how, how do you cope with, you know, the people who don't quite move out of that, that clay layer? What, what's been your approach to that? Mm. Well, taking people through these accelerated leadership programs, these ALP and ATPs, yeah. um, is not a free ride. So yeah. you are there and the program is designed such that you do need to engage yeah. uh, and you need to go deep. And even if it is a multi-hierarchical group, yeah. I, we have seen many times where because you create that environment where people are expected to, to connect deeper, that they also start asking each other questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and therefore uh, we have had people discover during the workshop, this is not for me, I leave the company. Yeah. And that's fine, yeah. right? And there's people that said, wow, I have new purpose yeah. and I will do things in a different way. Um, and then of course, yeah, yeah by, by, by let's say senior leadership engaging on all levels, you will find people that are blocking and they mm. need to go. Mm. Yeah. One other thing I would add is if you want to start a fire, go where the heat is. So find those people who really are the champions and let it grow from there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Hi, Jean Kerr from Cisco. So on the topic of the behaviours, almost everybody in this room put their hand up when you said, do you have lovely shiny behaviours? Uh, on a, perhaps on a screensaver or a, or a mouse mat. But our challenge is getting the role modelling embedded. Mm. So 
you, the question is, what changed about who was successful when it mm. came to the role modelling? How did you tackle that? Well, in the first 18 months, I think we talked a lot about these four uh, behaviours um, and made it topic of every meeting. Um, taking ownership, uh, not standing on the sideline, being eager to win, are we happy with this result? I mean, you can weave these into everyday conversation in every meeting that you are in. Um, and we saw it become adopted at all levels very quickly. Uh, it went actually faster than I had expected because the, it was such a natural language and so much appealing to people. Um, and, and we held up the mirror. Are we eager enough to win? Are we eager to beat the competition, to win the next customer? And these are simple questions that people say, yeah, maybe we are not. Um, so it went, this, this part went uh, faster, the behavioral change than uh, we really had to deepen. Uh, by the way, these four behaviors are integrated in the workshop design also. Good morning, my name is Natalie Hasenberg. I'm from ABN Emro. And thank you for the nice uh, story. I was wondering if you met any international challenges, like different challenges in different countries, like mm. cultural differences, and how did you deal with it? Mm. Would you like to answer that? Yeah, please? sure. Uh, great question. So we have something that we use in the workshops around storytelling. And it's very personal, and it's also very, um, very powerful for people to get to know each other in a team, even people who've worked together for 10, 15, 20 years. And initially we thought, is this going to work in Asia, where people tend to be a little bit more guarded about their personal life? And we found that it worked beautifully. People share to the level of depth that they want. It worked in the Mideast. It worked in North America. I'm from New York. We can tend to be a little bit cynical about things. And it actually worked in New York, too. But it's a great question, and I think when you touch the human heart and the human soul in terms of the purpose, it speaks to everybody, and it's amazing, the result. Thank you. I, I, I seem to occupy my mind a lot about people performance indicators lately, and I was curious on, on what do you follow up? You, you talk about market share and, and sales, and that's one end of things, and they're all interrelated, but what would you say is two, three key people performance indicators that you use on your level of the, of the company? Well, it's about the what and the how. So the what is what you just referred to, uh, all the indicators, you know, both financial and non-financial, uh, leading and lagging. But the how is really how people drive a result. And this is where we embedded the behaviors in the evaluation criteria uh, of how people engage as a leader as an employee. So are they demonstrating the eagerness to win? Are they demonstrating the teaming up to excel? Uh, from all the four behaviors, by the way, the teaming up to excel is definitely the weakest. Right? And um, you, can, you can call that out. You can include it in the, in the performance dialogues. Uh, we do calibration, and then we use the same behaviors to calibrate you know, people's view around uh, individuals. Uh, so we make behavior uh, uh, and the how uh, an, an explicit topic of the performance review. I'm glad to hear that Team Up to Excel was your most difficult. We can definitely relate. And so mm. my question is around how you used your structure and governance to help create a more team and collaborative environment, especially in a multinational, multicultural company. Oh, great question. Um, so I, I have this obsession with the Galbraith model um, because <laughs> Philips restructured for 25 years and always only used the weapon of structure. Yeah? With the argument, if only I report to somebody else, my problem is solved. Actually, nothing changes. <laughs> so a restructuring and a change in org structure does very little for performance. Um, so we, 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 we realized we had to de-emphasize that. And I have a strong belief that in this 21st century, uh, it is agile teams that form around challenges and that quickly drive a project result end-to-end -end across structures that will be most successful. 
Uh, and therefore, we need to de-emphasize the role of the site and the department and the structure. We need to de-emphasize, if I only please my boss, I'm okay. No, you need to actually deliver a result end-to-end -end through the customer value chain, and that is how we will judge your performance. So input-output metrics through the, the value chain is very important. Um, uh, that also means that for measuring the P&L, the profit and loss statement, we need to shift. And the language in the company about who owns the P&L, mm. this is very bad language. <laughs> yeah? Only the CEO owns the P&L. Right? And all the rest contribute to that. And frankly speaking, I can't even drive the P&L. It's my people who do that. So I'm dependent on my people. Uh, but if people say, I own the, the P&L, it starts creating a certain behavior. Like, I decide and you shut up. Right? Uh, but really, I need both the innovation center and the market center teams to collaborate. And if one says, I'm better than you are, uh, which was the case, you know, we were very global, very business unit centric, and uh, you, you know, here's the product, I've invented it, you sell it. Yes, but it is the wrong product. Well, it doesn't matter, you shut up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to get collaboration, and therefore we invented the collaborative P&L, rather than saying it's the business unit that owns the P&L, or it's the market that owns the P&L. We say we want a collaborative P&L, and we will judge both the B and the M, the business unit and the market <coughs> team, on the joint result. Um, now, it's a little bit more work, but it starts three years in, starts to really uh, work better, and it starts shifting the conversation from talking about the numbers talk to talking about the enablers. So it's, it's quite a fundamental uh, shift. Uh, Graham Broadbelt from Impact International. Um, it's a fas fascinating story. I just wonder, Francis, if you could help us to understand how customers experience the change that you've wrought in the organization? Customers see us um, more agile and faster. Um, they see us um, more depending on each other rather than talking to all these different individuals. Um, they like the, the newfound energy, passion, and spirit about being innovative and entrepreneurial. Those are you know, the, the ones that we also emphasize. Um, they see the change in the company from people that almost complain in front of the customers. Of course, I want to help you, but you know my organization or the business unit to, oh, you want that? I'm going to make it happen for you. Right? And I'll call my colleagues on the other side of the ocean to make it work. Uh, so customers recognize that. And, uh, if I take our consumer business, uh, has been growing Th uh, through the last two years at 10% a year. Uh, even in Europe, we have been growing, whereas there's a crisis still. So it's, it's quite phenomenal, and we, we've gained market share as a consequence. But now everybody talks about, you know, what is locally relevant, for example. Um, and that didn't happen before, because in the, in the past, it would be the business unit that would say, well, here's the catalog, you guys go sell. But now the French team says, you know what, I need something that caters for the French, and we invented the soup maker for the French. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Locally relevant, yeah. <laughs> Works beautifully. Okay, I think I have time for one last question, anybody? No? Okay, so friends, Teddy, thank you very much for kicking off the session. <laughs> Fantastic um, presentation and, and, and great questions as well. So You're thank welcome. you very much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>